Erbol and his father travel only on horseback, and for good reason. Kyrgyzstan, bordering on China and Kazakhstan, is a mountainous land, further than the eye can see. Under the snow grows wild juniper. His mother needs some, and she has asked Erbol, the youngest of the family, to bring some back for her. Their house is perched at an altitude of 2,400 meters, far from any signs of civilization. For miles around, there is no sign of humanity. They live in the territory of wild animals. In the winter, they enjoy extreme temperatures sometimes as low as minus 50 degrees. But their real enemy isn't the cold, it's the wolf, a ruthless predator. Two days ago, the wolves killed a few mares in the neighboring village. To protect his herd, his father keeps a watch out for them. Erbol doesn't have school today, so he accompanies him. They found the wolf trail, and it's dangerously close to their house. Tomorrow, on his way to school and by himself, he will have fear in the pit of his stomach, as is always the case when the threat of the wolves is near. At 12 years old, Erbol is the youngest in his family, the last of the children to still live with his parents. His father teaches him to dominate this hostile environment, just as he did with his six brothers and sisters. At his age, it's a question of survival. If the teeth of the metal trap close in on one of the wolves, the others will flee the danger and distance themselves, a precaution that is reassuring to Erbol the day before his first day of school. Erbol is very attached to his horse. Buru is a true companion. More than that, he's his only means of getting to his middle school. Ever since he was little, Erbol has always watched his mother do this in the exact same way. To purify the house, she burns the juniper in the four directions of the house, starting in the east and finishing in the north. His little family home has neither electricity nor running water. They must get freezing cold water from a stream buried under the snow. Erbol is a hero in the eyes of his young cousin, who does not yet go to school. He's flattered by the attention and takes great pleasure in telling of his many adventures on the way to school. It's a great way to pique his cousin's interest in learning to read.
When Erbel leaves for school in the morning, his mother worries about him. His safety is completely dependent on the weather and taking to the road alone increases the challenges. Her son will have to fend for himself in every situation. She needs to hear him say that he won't take any unnecessary risks to get to school on time. His father, however, wants to be sure that his teachers recognize the merits of his son. At 12 years of age, coming from so far, doing his homework by candlelight, his teachers must understand how hard he's working to succeed. Above all, it's very important that he impress his conviction that if Erbol succeeds in his studies, he will have a good future. Erbal loves living in this majestic landscape in the heart of the mountains of Central Asia. However, education has opened his eyes to broader horizons and deep in the heart another desire is growing. As much as he passionately loves these mountains, he doubts he will perpetuate his parents' lifestyle. He may make the decision to leave. Erbol is determined to pursue higher education to become a computer scientist. Proud to be Kyrgyz, he finds great pleasure in studying the history of his people, his origins and the great destinies of the men who fought for the independence of his country. But above all, he loves the songs of his father's childhood, the folk songs that keep the culture of his nomadic ancestors passionate horseback riders alive. <laughs> It is 5 a.m. The cold is brutal, minus 40 degrees on the thermometer, even colder in reality because of the wind chill. Erbol braces himself to leave the cozy heat of his house. His school is 13 kilometers away. It's on the other side of the mountains. 
A three-hour ride through the highest peaks of the mountains awaits Erbo. Even though he knows this route by heart, his father always advises him to be extra careful and always gives him the same advice, never to let go of his horse. That is the golden rule. The first few kilometers always feel like an adventure, an exciting mixture of responsibility and not having a care in the world. Erbol has cultivated an incredibly deep complicity with his horse. He and Buru share the many secrets of the route they take every morning and every evening. Their preferred itinerary, the fields where they gallop freely, the streams where they drink, and also the danger zones where the wolves roam. They count on each other. In this deserted wilderness, the slightest mishap can be fatal. If the ice breaks, there is no chance of survival without being rescued. Buru is worried, but Erbal is less afraid of falling than of the wolves. He reassures himself by encouraging Buru. They have been on the road for an hour and a half now. With each challenge, they lose a little more time. It's impossible to predict how many more obstacles they will encounter. They still have time, but they're only halfway there.
No matter how well Erbo knows this trail, the way to school is different each time. There is always the possibility of danger or wonderful surprises. <laughs> It may not seem like it, but these wild berries are a great treasure. They're worth wasting a few precious minutes. Erbo broke the golden rule by letting go of Buru. In this white desert, without his horse, he knows he's in danger. I don't call him. Ah. Oof. <sighs> 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 It's been almost two hours since Erbo left. If everything goes well from here, he'll be at his desk in a half an hour. <laughs> 
Buna mektepke de geçikken yok bu cetkene kaldık bu yaşta. Erbol feels exceptionally free while galloping, a liberty that allows him to let go of all his tensions. Riding over the Kyrgyz mountains will have taken him three hours. Erbol has made his target. He arrives at his older sister's house. She lives in the village with their grandmother. It is here that he leaves Buru. <laughs> Before going to school, he gets ready to meet his classmates. The young horseman from the mountains converts himself into a proper schoolboy. <laughs> Later this evening, he will recuperate his mount, and together they will take the same trail back home. When Erbol meets up with his friend, he has no regrets whatsoever about having disobeyed his father. <laughs> <laughs> Throughout the world, every morning, thousands of fortunate children take to the road on their quest for knowledge. Their dreams will design the world of tomorrow. It is the end of summer in the Siberian peninsula of Yamal, located above the polar circle at the farthest ends of the Earth. With the arrival of September, Stas is about to have his very first day of school ever in a boarding school several hundred kilometers away. It will be a bit of a culture shock, one that his father prepares him for. Stas's entire world is this immense Siberian desert far from any signs of civilization. These are vast plains beaten by the wind that he and his family have been navigating since he was born. His departure for school is a veritable blind leap. Stas was born a Nenets, a prince of the tundra, as his name indicates. This nomadic people raise reindeer, and the Yamal Peninsula has been their land for more than a thousand years. At the camp base, chores are clearly delineated. Everyone gives a hand. A 
minutes must know how to do everything with his own two hands, with only the help of a few simple tools. Their movements are based on the migration of the reindeer, a rhythm that hasn't changed for centuries. To survive, these beautiful animals must move constantly because their main food, lichen, only grows several millimeters per year. The family's life is devoted to guiding the herds towards constantly renewed pastures. Not very different from that of his ancestors, Stas's life is harsh in this inhospitable climate where temperatures can drop to below minus 50 degrees Celsius in winter. It's such a harsh life that Lena, one of Stas's sisters, is contemplating leaving the tundra. She's the oldest at 15. She's already planning her future in the city. However, she does have reservations. There is always something to be done at the camp. The Nenet's mother, guardian of the family hearth, can be very stern when the chores aren't done. Since today is the last day before his departure for school, Stas exceptionally has some free time. He goes fishing with his father, accompanied by Masha, his other 13-year-old sister. She's also leaving for boarding school tomorrow with Stas and Lina. The two sisters have gone for several years now, and they will be able to watch over Stas. During these last days of summer, the temperatures are still very pleasant. Soon, the freezing cold winter will arrive and stay for nine months. In January and February, Siberia is plunged into non-stop darkness. The sun never rises. It's the polar night. For the very first time, Stas will spend winter in the city. A young reindeer has been chosen as their pet. It's their custom. They'll raise him in the chum until he's old enough to get along alone. He will never be killed. When he's an adult, he'll integrate into the herd, but will remain tame and free to come and go in the tent. The Nenets' children live a nomadic lifestyle with their parents until the age of seven, when they're obliged to go to boarding school. Stas's mother is very happy that he can benefit from this educational system, even though it deprives the camp of precious help during the winter. What concerns her is that her child might never want to return to the tundra after they've been educated, that they'll abandon the nomadic lifestyle and reindeer breeding for life in the city. The seasonal migration of the Nenets has always followed the reindeer, the fields in the north during the summer months and the forests of the south during the winter. Dispersed throughout the immensity of the tundra, they've been the guardians of this fragile ecosystem for centuries. It's a vast region, swampy, muddy, snowy, or frozen solid depending on the season. Sleds, slow and uncomfortable, are much more practical than 4x4s and remain the best method of transportation to this day. But to get to school by sled would take several days. They're several hundred kilometers away from their boarding school. On this first day of school, a helicopter will come to the camp to take the children to school. Stasi's father announces the bad news. The helicopter won't be able to come close to the camp because of the weather. Last year, the children had to wait for a truck to take them to the city, which made them miss the first few weeks of school. There's still a chance that the children can leave. They just need to get to a place where the helicopter can land by tomorrow. Stasi's mother makes a decision. They will leave at dawn. The family clan, a dozen people counting the uncles and cousins, all live in the same chum, or traditional tent. Here, 
There are no telephones or any other means of communication. Stas' uncle goes to the neighboring camps to gather information. It's the last night with his family. The separation from his family will be very long for Stas. He won't return to the tundra until the summer vacation at the end of May, in nine months. Tomorrow is the beginning of a whole new life. The family is ready to go. His mother and sisters have already begun assembling all of their belongings and preparing the sleds they will use to transport everything. Stas is in charge of getting water at the lake. The family is expert at moving camp. They rarely stay more than a week in one place. It takes them less than an hour to organize, break down, and load everything. Like all nomadic people, they live with the bare minimum and everyone knows their role well. All the icons must be loaded onto the sacred sled and no one can sit on it. All of the family belongings, as well as the chum, are wrapped and harnessed to roughly 20 sleds each one made by hand without any metal or nails. Their lassoes and cords are made of leather from the tendons of the reindeer and their tools and parts of the sleds are made from reindeer bone. Their traditional habitat, the chum, can be assembled and broken down quickly to facilitate migration. It's a very solid structure composed of long poles organized into a comb and covered in a thick felt which is then covered with reindeer skins that have all been sewn together. It's very resistant and protects the inhabitants from the wind and the cold. The entrance always faces the same direction, one of the numerous implicit rules of the Nenets. Choosing and capturing the reindeer that will be harnessed to drag the sleds is a vital mission. It's the most time-consuming and can take hours. Only a few of the animals have been trained to drag the sleds. Each member of the family can recognize them from the thousands of animals in the herd. They must be caught by lasso with the help of dogs that drive them. Every member of the family must help, each one having his own particular style. The selected reindeers are held in a pen so that they can be harnessed. The most experienced ones will lead and the young, vigorous males will follow. Stas has not quite perfected the art of the lasso. He lacks experience.
The family must travel about 15 kilometers to get to the spot where the helicopter will land. No need for navigational instruments. Nenets have an innate sense of orientation. They move according to traditional itineraries. Their way of life may seem eternal, but they are threatened by many dangers such as global climate change and many resources of their land that are attracting attention. Russia pumps 90% of its gas production from the earth of the Yamal district. Roads are a very difficult obstacle for the reindeer and pollution threatens to alter the quality of their pastures. Successfully migrating from year to year is becoming more and more challenging. Stas' generation will have to adapt. Stas would love to drive the sled, but they're in a big hurry this time, and there's no room for errors. His father will drive the sled with his long wooden pole, known here as a koray. Stas wish is granted after all. It's his last day as a nomad for quite a while. The caravan has arrived at the new campsite. The valley where the helicopter will land is on the other side of the hills. The children will have to finish the last four kilometers on foot. Final advice and blessings to the children. The most difficult moment has passed and the children continue their journey excited with the prospect of new adventures. There are too many emotions for the little seven-year-old. After an hour of walking, Stas is overcome by fatigue. Masha encourages him. The valley is on the other side of that peak. The girls are impatient to see their girlfriends. Stas has no idea what awaits him. 
A thick fog has settled in the area and visibility is very low. The mother is worried. They will have to deal with the campsite later. They must urgently find the children in the valley to help them be seen by the helicopter. If it doesn't, they will be stuck on the icy plain at nightfall. The children hear the sound of the helicopter, but it passed without seeing them half an hour ago. They're freezing cold. The family hopes the fire will attract the helicopter. He may not come back. They use every method possible. Prayers, incantations, shamanism. Stas hears a buzzing far off. They must be ready. helicopter stops many times to ensure all of the children of the region have been picked up for school. It also transports the sick and anyone in need of going to the city on an emergency. Stas's aunt lives in the city. 
She welcomes the children and will take them to school. This is the first encounter for Stas with his new schoolmates. The first encounter with his new life. All of the children of the tundra have not yet arrived, but the professor begins his presentation with some fundamental Russian. Путин Владимир Владимирович, вот он, Путин Владимирович. Так же, как мы с Еленой Федоровной много-много лет так же пытались... During the Soviet era, the Nenets were not allowed to speak their own language. Today, the Russian language is predominant, but Nenets has reappeared and is now taught in the schools, as is the nomadic culture of the tundra and reindeer. Throughout the world, every morning, thousands of fortunate children take to the road on their quest for knowledge. Their dreamers will design the world of tomorrow. Yeah, just that's the day. Yeah. Stop, I'll show you. 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 I'